Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the opening act of NerdFest. Um, I'm your host, Chris, K0SWE, and I'm going to start us off by talking about AMSAT. Um, amateur satellites, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. They're freaking awesome, right? It's amazing that as amateurs we've had the opportunity to launch stuff into space and talk over it and it's also amazing that as a technician class licensee you can access this stuff um it's just one of the most theoretically exciting things about ham radio in my opinion uh, it's so cool that we have this opportunity uh my introduction to AMSAT was actually a couple of years ago at a Armham University. Uh, we had Doug N6UA in to talk the full three hours about uh, his experience with AMSAT. And it was amazing to hear all the traveling he'd done in order to get all the grid squares and all of the experience that he had gained over the years and all of the tips and tricks that he had. And, uh, you know, after hearing his talk, uh, I went out and got my own aero antenna and I got my own full dual, full duplex, uh, dual band HT. And I was ready to get out there and work some birds, right? And come to find out, um, it's kind of hard. <laughs> um, I've made a couple of attempts at you know, manual pointing as the bird's going over and uh, trying to make the cue so and fiddling with the radio with my non-existent other hand. It's it's kind of a difficult technique to master. Um, as I say, you've got a lot of things to do. Um, even Doug pointed this out, that there's just so many things. You need extra hands to be able to manage it all you're probably looking at your smartphone to be able to tell where the bird is going past. Uh, maybe you've got that taped to your antenna so you can kind of keep an eye on it, but you're also simultaneously trying to make the contact and understand what's going on through the static. And if you're unlucky and don't have a, a voice recorder, then you're, you're trying to log this by hand at the same time. You're juggling a lot of things um, and so it's actually a pretty difficult technique to to master if you're using uh, all of this inexpensive equipment. So my thought is, all right, how can I make this easier on myself? How can I automate some of these things? Like I say, instead of logging in real time, you get a little audio recorder and, you know, you just transcribe it afterward. Or, I don't know, maybe these days you can transcribe it in real time with uh, a AI or something. I don't know. Um, for the uh, the tuning, I completely forgot to mention on the last page, you've got to be tuning for Doppler adjustments. You know, as the bird is coming towards you, you need to be transmitting at a lower frequency so the bird receives it at the expected frequency and you're receiving it at a higher frequency. And it's completely the opposite case when it's going the other direction. But there's software that can do the tuning for you if you've got cat control. Um, and that's, you know, depending on the rig that you choose, uh, it's pretty easy to do rig control for Doppler adjustments. So those are two easy things that we can automate. Um, but I really, really wanted to figure out this azimuth elevation uh, rotator. Um, Obviously, this does the pointing of the antenna for you. Um, you've got software to predict where the satellite's going to be, and this thing just keeps track of it for you. So you don't have to pay attention to the antenna as it's going overhead. You just pay attention to the timer and maybe do some adjustments for polarity. But um, it's a... Uh... You know, that's a reasonable thing that you would want to automate. Um, so when it comes to automating these uh, satellites, uh, 
automating tracking satellites, you've got to know about TLEs. These are two line elements. And this is the basic format that you can download this file and it's got all of these two line pairs that tell you where the satellite's going to be at any given time. Um, these are inputs into a set, a family of models known as simplified perturbation models. Uh, the math is beyond me, but what I know is you put in a time and a TLE, and what you get out of the other end is you get lat long and elevation for the satellite. And from there, it's a relatively simple matter of figuring out how to point from here to there. Uh, that's that's pretty straightforward math, apparently. Uh, but I didn't have to do any of this because that's already implemented by things like gpredict. And uh, the other thing we'll talk about also is ISS detector, uh, two pieces of software that you can use uh, for just automating this process. Uh, so the software is all there. Um, does the downloads for you. You don't have to mess with any of the TLEs by hand. You just say download and you've got all these satellites at your command. Now we need the hardware. That shouldn't be too hard, right? I mean, it's okay, it's got to hold a little bit of weight, but it's two motors or two servos or two stepper motors. It's something with two degrees of freedom, right? It, it can't be that hard. Um, well, if you want to go and buy something, uh, turns out this must be harder than it looks because these things are really expensive. The one that everyone knows and loves is called the Yesu G5500. Um, the rotator itself, I think, runs about 700 bucks. And then you also need a controller, which if you get Yesu branded is for 500 bucks. This is more than I'm going to pay just so I can figure out if I really, really enjoy AMSAT or not. Um, Our Finder had a port as L that they sold for I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks. I don't know if they're actually serious about carrying this thing. It, it looks fairly new to their lineup and who knows if it's actually going to stick. Uh, if you want to get really serious, if you want the big three meter dishes or you want an entire EME array, uh, then there's this Alpha or RF design or a ham design um, RAS, big RAS. These things are for much bigger antennas than what I need. Uh, Wind Radio has an offering that I emailed them for a quote and they said, yeah, we make it. Do you actually want it? Uh, I'm not going to get into any of this just so I can figure out if I really, really enjoy it. Upset. So that got me into searching around for alternatives. What can we do for say under 500 bucks for an AMSAT rotator. Um, so there's a guy out there, Robert Goodman, K3RRR, who has a couple of projects listed on his website. Uh, and these are the sort of, uh, I'll call them low tech solutions, but really they're pretty ingenious for what they are. Uh, for one of these, the El Cheapo, he uses an X10 pan and tilt camera mount. Uh, he did not figure out a way to get it hooked up to uh, a tracking software, but at least he can, you know, push buttons and he's not holding it up the entire time because 15 minutes of holding a pound and a half, it actually gets pretty heavy eventually. Uh, and then he has his attic contraption here. And really it's, it's just a TV rotator, so it's um, it turns in azimuth. It's actually fixed at whatever this is, 15 degrees or something. But he claims that this is actually really good enough to work like 60% of the passes that he cares about. So uh, it actually works a good much of the time, surprisingly, even just being azimuth only. So there's a couple of options that I looked at. Uh, this one here, Sark Track. Um, this one we actually used up at Armham Field Day in South Park uh, last year. 
Um, this one is built by a an Australian club called School of Amateur Radio Clubs, SARC. Um, they built it for a while, but it's no longer sold uh, due to parts constraints. Um, this one uses the ESP chipsets, which includes Wi-Fi, and that's awesome. Uh, you don't have to have control wires hooked up to this thing between this and the computer. All you need is power, really. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. And from what I gather at uh, Field Day, we had really good success with this. Here's another project. This one is open source plans. They go into great gory detail about all the parts you need and all of the sheet metal parts that you need cut and how you're going to bend them. Uh, they go through mechanical analysis to say where the stress is going to be on the thing. So they've really done a, an excellent job of designing and building this thing. Uh, it's also very involved. <laughs> um, the, the sheet metal fabrication is kind of beyond what I was willing to get into. Um, and so I opted not to go this direction. Uh, but this, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, this is an excellent so solution that maybe you'd take a look at. There's another one, Ant Runner. This one is produced by, I don't know, it looks like one guy out of China, one ham. Um, and it's it's not weather shielded. You can see all the insides, but uh, actually it looks pretty sturdy from looking at it. Um, and this one he sells either as a kit or as assembled. Uh, it's about 300 bucks, which is not too bad. It's within kind of the budget that I was looking for. <laughs> um, and it looks pretty sturdy. If I was going to buy something today, I might seriously take a look at this. Um, the one that I landed on building, and we'll do a demo of this in a little bit here. Now, this one is called Satran. Now, this was made by Daniel Nikolaisen, SM7YSA, uh, out of Sweden. Uh, he sold it as a kit or as assembled, uh, but he doesn't any longer. I get the feeling that uh, inventing and designing this thing was a lot more fun than actually trying to sell it and manage logistics and um, do international taxes and stuff. So he no longer sells these things, but he has open sourced all of his plans. And he's done a really good job of offering uh, STL files for 3D printing. And he's got Gerber files if you want to order the printed circuit boards. Um, he's got templates for the small sheet metal parts. Uh, and he's published the firmware that goes on this thing. Uh, also uses an ESP chipset, so it's got Wi-Fi. Um, and it implements the rote control daemon interface, which that's what all the rotators need to talk in order to interface with most of the uh, the tracking software. So it does that right out of the box. Um, so this one is pretty awesome, in my opinion. Um, I'm a little biased because this is the one I ended up building and like cursing over for a few weeks. Um, but I've been pretty happy with the results so far, and I'll show you how it does in just a moment. So one other solution I I was recommended to look at is actually telescope mounts uh, that have a go-to feature. These things are already out in the world. They're sort of consumer-friendly and heavy-duty. They carry more weight than an aero antenna already. They, they're designed for more... Uh, precision than what we need, you know, within a couple of degrees is good enough for a ham radio operator, but a couple of degrees to an astronomer is way, way off. And so these telescope mounts are much more precise than what we need. And hey, it's awesome. They come with a free telescope usually. <laughs> uh, I got one of these as a Santa gift for Christmas, and my family has really enjoyed using it as a telescope in addition to me tinkering around with it on ham radios. Um, and unlike amateur radio rotators, there's a very, very healthy used market uh, for these telescopes. 
Um, and so you can usually find a really good deal on these things. There's a couple of different styles here I should mention real quick. Um, you can get altitude azimuth is what they call it, um, altaz. You can get these mounts that sort of have one, one motor for altitude and another for azimuth, obviously. Um, the other style here is equatorial mounts. These are more used in astrophotography, and it gives a more stable uh, image. Basically, what you do is you line up this axis with usually the Earth's uh, pole, and then there's only one uh, motor that has to rotate as you're taking a picture. Either of these work for our purposes. Uh, they'll both take altitude azimuth coordinates and be just happy with it. Anyway, so just... um, and then I've got a couple of pieces of software here uh, that you should go through if you're interested. Uh, the first one that basically everything is going to use is this Hamlib root control. This is the Ham Library rotator control. Um, so. All of these different rotators speak a slightly different language, usually on like a serial port or something. Hamli broke control will standardize that and put it on the network. And so this is one common interface for all of the rest of the tracking software to talk to for controlling your rotator. Uh, the common one for desktop is gpredict, or the other one for desktop, I forgot to put this on the slide, uh, Ham Radio Deluxe. We'll do this in-house. Um, so you can use either of those uh, for doing the satellite tracking and those tracking software will talk back to rotator control. Uh, the other one that you can use is actually a mobile device app uh, called ISS Detector. And you can pay a few bucks to get the ham radio satellite extension. And not only does that let you start tracking ham radio satellites, but it also gives you rotator control. So that's awesome. All right. I guess we are going to dive into the demo. Um, you have about three minutes. Oh, I better hurry up then. <laughs> Here I was worried about filling time. Um, Ooh, my oh, OBS go. Here we go. All right. So obviously uh, we've got rig control here for doing Doppler tuning. Uh, but this is sort of the interesting part here for us is the rotator control. And let me cover cut you over to this view. Uh, we can only control one of these rotators at a time. Uh, so right now I've got a ra Raspberry Pi hooked up to this telescope mount. And if I engage that, you can see the, uh, the telescope mount actually starts moving. There is one problem with this telescope mount that I haven't figured out. And if anyone happens to know, let me know. Uh, this thing has backlash control, so it never settles in one place. Um, I can change the uh, azimuth on this and it'll move around, but it never really finds a happy spot. It just keeps backing off and trying to get to the right spot. Uh, that's a precision measure, I think, but it, it's really not what we need. And then I'll give you a view of the Satran there on the left side. Um, one of the challenges I've had with Satran is that the hardware works pretty well. I think the firmware needs a little bit of work, and I've been trying to do that in my spare time. Uh, but I've got too many projects going on, so. <laughs> but it's it seems to flake out sometimes and doesn't always respond immediately when you give it commands. Um, the other thing I'll show you is this uh, Satran calibration page. Like I said, this thing runs on Wi-Fi, so you just go to a web page to be able to calibrate it, or you can try and give it manual coordinates. Come on. Um, anyway, you believe me that I can give it manual coordinates. Um, 
So really, that's all I had for now. Um, sounds like we've got time for maybe one question. Would you have time for a question and a follow-up question? Probably. <laughs> okay, uh, Roger Oki, uh, W3MAX. Um, I, uh, I've been thinking about this. You have an equatorial mount there. What, what's the longest transit time for any satellite, you know, for the longest transit time for a ham satellite to go, go from horizon to horizon, approximately? Approximately 15 minutes. Okay. So given that time, one thing I was thinking about for, for doing a, a DIY mount is if you are, instead of aligning that axis with the Earth's axis, like on an equatorial mount, if you align it with the axis of the orbit of the satellite, you can drive it with only one motor um, yeah. from horizon to horizon with, if it's, if it's 15 minutes, that's going to be like a three degree error. Um, as the Earth rotates under it, which is the the, the thing that that would drive it off, um, has anyone tried that? Not that I have come across. Um, I agree that would be a very practical way to do things to align this equatorial axis with the axis of the satellite. Um, I don't know that anyone has gone through the work. Um, that would probably need a little bit more work on the software side. Uh, yeah. To understand that you've got an equatorial mount and you need to align that first. Yeah, but that would uh, um, reduce it to, to a, just a single motor. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, yes, and, and there would be a lot more math involved or different math involved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. All right, I guess that's all I have. Um, I believe well, I'm we have, to well. We have probably another minute for uh, another question if somebody has one. I think Paul had a question. Have you looked at CCTV PTZ units? I haven't looked much myself. Um, like I say, this guy, Robert Goodman, had tried something similar. Um, in theory, there's nothing that would prevent this from working. I, the antenna might be a little bit heavier than what these things would expect. But not that much. Uh, it'd be worth a look. I think you'd have to worry a little bit more about wind load than just this the simple weight. Yeah, that's probably true. I'm not a mechanical guy, so this is all me making stuff up. Well, the other thing you'll have to worry about is just the moment, right? Because if you have a really long boom, Twisting that uh, takes quite a bit of force. So, right. um, KC2 SHO made a comment. I'd like to find an um, as Paul rotator that will turn my create CLP. 5130-1N. I presume that's a really big antenna. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, I'm not familiar off the top of my head either. Um, this Yesu is described as light to medium duty. I've seen some fairly hefty antennas mounted on this. Uh, many of us were at Bob Sterner's house a few years ago. Um, but, you know, without knowing that specific antenna... I couldn't say whether it'd work for sure. I would I would look at uh, the Alpha Spid products if you're looking for something heavy. <laughs>